Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we, first, we want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for another installment of our research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU's efforts include providing online courses to K-12 students across Michigan and the United States, as well as providing a variety of professional learning opportunities for educators focused on innovative educational practices, such as blended learning, providing resources, products, and services to personalize learning options for their students, and improve student achievement. Before we introduce today's presenter and the topic of the presentation, just an important disclaimer for our research webinar series. This webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views. Um, sorry, views, opinions, conclusions, and other information which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI unless otherwise specified. Today, we are glad to welcome Dr. Dennis Beck from the University of Arkansas. Dennis is an assistant professor of educational technology at the University of Arkansas. He enjoys teaching courses in instructional design, integrating technology into the curriculum, and educational technology research. He also has a wealth of experience in the design of online and blended courses in educational and corporate training environments. He has published in several other venues, including Computers in Education, American Journal of Distance Education, Educational Administration Quarterly, the Journal of Educational Research, and the Journal of Virtual Worlds Research. It's my pleasure to welcome Dennis. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, this is Dennis Beck, and um, I just wanted to um, start by, um, by thanking everybody for attending. And then also just to kind of give a brief background on um, why I, I, I chose to do this particular literature review of games used in K kindergarten through 12th grade schools um, and looking at what literature was out there. Um, I do a lot of research in with uh, virtual and cyber and blended environments. Um, and in the process of doing that, I've also spent a lot of time in face-to-face um, -face in brick-and-mortar schools uh, working with teachers um, and constantly what seems to come up constantly is uh, a need to create more engaging um, more authentic learning environments and learning experiences in schools um, and in almost every single conversation with teachers that I've had the, the, the concept of oh I really wish I could use games comes up, but it, it's almost as if it's, a, it's something that's up on the shelf or it's out of reach and um, is, is something that the average teacher is, is not well equipped to be able to, to use it. Um, and so um, whenever, whenever I was beginning to speak with the MVLRI folks about the possibilities of doing this particular literature review and this research, um, it, uh, this came up and um, I thought it was really good potential uh, fit for some of my interests. Um, because even though we know some best practices about how to use games in education in general, there's really little research that's distinguished the, the, what's out there by the age of the participant with a focus on K-12 students. Um, and that's what um, I'm hoping this kind of provides for us. Um, what I did um, is right here is basically look at a, a three-step process. Um, in step one, um, I looked at the, the different databases that are listed there on the left-hand column. I'm not going to read them all for, for time's sake, um, but there was a lot of them. Um, and uh, I really searched in step one um, for the type of the game and the participants. So things like computer games, video games, serious games, simulation games, um, MMOG, MMORPG, online games, um, and then also for a type of participant like 
uh, K-12, primary, secondary, middle, elementary, high school, those sorts of terminology. And it should be noted that I had a lot of help um, in a way because um, there's a lot of literature reviews, or there's not a lot, but there were several literature reviews um, in the past um, on the use of games in general in education. Um, and Boyle, 2012, um, and, and, and uh, their colleagues um, in 2012 and 2016, and Connolly in 2012, um, and so I had some some colleagues that I that I was able to contact and talk to about their reasoning for the uh, the terms that they used, um, and then once I understood that, being able to refine them for um, for the purposes that I had. Um, so then went to you can see step one resulted in um, twenty seven thousand seven hundred and seventy uh, papers. So quite a few papers, right? Um, so. The step two, I really wanted to still further filter the number of studies by looking for terms related to game-related outcomes. Um, one of the things that I thought Boyle did in uh, 20, 2016 was break them down by game-related outcomes. And even though I, um, I tweaked Boyle's list a, a good bit, um, it still is a, a good idea to be able to not just categorize the end result, but to filter by that as well. And so um, using effective terms like engagement and immersion and motivation, um, attitude, uh, behavioral terms, um, cognitive and perceptual terms, uh, knowledge, knowledge acquisition terms, um, skill related terms, um, some of the physiological outcome terms, um, and also some soft skills and social outcomes related terms really helped kind of narrow that down to the 1,422 papers. Um, and then in step three, um, I used terms uh, related to, to relevance, really. Um, and in that, I read the, actually read the abstracts of all the papers and kept only the papers that ranged between January of 2000 and October of 2016, um, that papers that were published in an academic journal and included participants between the ages of five years old and all the way up through older adults. Um, and using those three steps um, got me to 250 studies. Um, however, 774 of those were duplicates, which left 177 papers to review. Um, okay. And here is the categories that I sorted these 177 studies by. And I'll go into the details on these as in the following slides. So. Um, I, at first, I wanted to categorize them by whether they were games that were playable online versus offline. Um, also, um, how games were tested, um, what participants they were studied. You can see there the breakdowns in parentheses, K-12, higher ed, adult, older adult, and then mixed. Uh, by the game genre, uh, role-playing, simulation games, um, simulations. By the way, the difference between that is a pure simulation was something that was not actually a game that was played. It was just a simulation itself, whereas the simulation game was a, a simulation embedded in a game. Um, somatosensory, and then there were some, there were several that were non-genre focused research. Um, and then the content areas, you could see quite a few from science and health ed, soft skills, social studies, et cetera, and then the different game outcomes, which I mentioned earlier. Oh, and one other one that I, that I wanted to include, and I'll touch on later, uh, was really how games were tested. Um, they were whether they were tested in a like a face-to-face -face, um, classroom or laboratory, or whether they were tested online, or in this case, whether that information wasn't provided. Um, here's a little bit of the results. Um, many of the games were playable. This is interestingly enough online, but tested in a face-to-face -face classroom or lab. And I found that really fascinating. Um, because online environments, um, as we all know, don't have the same types of scaffolding that face-to-face -face environments do, um, especially in terms of on-site teacher support. Um, and even though this amount of high-quality research is promising for the brick-and-mortar and the blended learning environments, I think it really speaks to the need for more research to see what kind of scaffolding might be needed if the games were implemented in online environments. And additionally, it begs the question of why more game-related research is not accomplished online. 
Um, here's another one, a real basic graph here. Um, and oh, Justin, by the way, thank you for posting the full paper link. You can see that there in the chat for everybody. Um, it, the, these are the participants study. You can see about 49% were higher ed participants, 29% uh, K-12. Um, there was the mix, the older adult, and the adult. Um, I thought it was really kind of interesting about that, that breakdown. Um, still definitely a large amount of K-12 research, uh, despite some of the presence of larger obstacles to doing research in K-12 schools compared to other environments. Um, things like uh, the challenge of getting institutions to participate, uh, difficulty in getting informed consent from parents, and teachers who lack a vision for classroom research. Um, here's, here's how the breakdown was in terms of game genre. Um, as you can see here, uh, role playing and uh, non-genre uh, related games um, were, were most, um, or non-genre related research, excuse me, were, were most um, focused there. Um, they had the, the largest numbers. Uh, but you can also see um, sim simulation games had quite a bit, and first FPS, by the way, is first-person shooters, um, and then you could say simulations as well as somatosensory um, games as well. Um, a little bit about the academic content areas. Um, I mentioned them earlier. Um, there was this variety of academic subject areas, which I thought was very rich to see that. Um, you could see the science games were the most dominant, um, health ed, with, along with health ed, uh, but also soft skills games, social studies, business, computers, language learning, math, and art. A little bit about game outcomes. Um, so at effective outcomes, the left bar there, um, concern those that involve how participants receive, respond, value, organize, and characterize stimuli. So the K-12 research here um, in that area really focused on the influence of games on student engagement. Um, for example, uh, there's one particular um, study by Aneta et al. in 2009 that researched the impacts of a teacher-authored game about genetics on student engagement. Um, there were other things that looked at, other studies that looked at the levels of immersion among video game users who were digital natives. Um, and in this case, they found that digital native students varied greatly in their levels of immersion and that other variables such as gender had more predictive power, which anybody who understands the digital native literature is shaking their heads. Yes, obviously. Um, so uh, and then you can see the next column there, behavioral change, um, really focused on what the participant was expected to do or produce. So in that, the K-12 research focused on a lot of time the association between reward and punishment features in games on player satisfaction. Um, also, uh, K-12 students who cheated in gameplay um, and kind of what the correlation was with cheating in school. Um, there was also research that looked at game cheating behavior and what other factors were impacted in that. Um, the perceptual and cognitive skills, really here perceptual and cognitive skills or perceptual or is like the ability to organize and interpret the information that's seen and give it meaning, where cognitive skills are more the core skills that your brain uses to think, to read, to learn, to remember, to reason, to pay attention. And a lot of the K-12 research focused on the use of science or math-based simulations games for learning um, and the use of simulations to assess cognitive skills. Um, to give you an example of this, um, um, I, I can't pronounce the name, sorry, it's Jacola et al. Um, in 2011 showed that students' understanding of circuits increased with the use of simulations. Um, Huppert is another one that looked at how simulations were used to increase students' cognitive and science process skills in microbiology. Um, and there's, a, there's another one, Hauptmann, that looked at virtual worlds and the use of virtual worlds to increase spatial thinking abilities with geometry content. Okay, so that was a perception on cognitive skills. The next category, as you can see, that by far the largest game outcome was knowledge acquisition. And really just, that's, it's what it is, is what it says it is. It's, it's games that are um, focused on learning specific content knowledge. 
Um, and I thought it would be really helpful just to kind of kind of go go through and, and list um, the different areas um, that the different research studies hit on. Games for geography, uh, substance abuse, physics, displacement and velocity, uh, marine ecosystems, animal science, biology, chemistry, um, within chemistry, chemical bonding, kinetic molecular theory, things like that. Um, nutrition, like the food pyramid. In, within math, games on geometry and pre-algebra and algebra one. Um, sex education, uh, language learning, including ESL, English as a second language. Um, citizen involvement, so more of like a digital citizenship type thing. And, and, and one particular interesting one other than digital citizenship was a city planning simulation, which I thought was really interesting. And then uh, on the arts in general and a lot of the fine arts. And then the last column certainly not the least, is the physiological outcomes. And these were research that was often characterized by changes in physical state. So um, a lot of times the K-12 research looked at finding connections between emotional state and physiological response. So, for example, um, balling in 2012 showed that social distress results from being excluded from a social gameplay activity by peers. Um, and social and physical distress, sorry. Um, also, um, uh, another one, Van Riekum, looked at goal conduciveness and related events in a game, and he showed that they were, were associated with changes to heartbeat, pulse, skin conductance, and temperature, um, and showed a direct link between cortisol levels and video game play. And um, their research really looked at how Adolescents who spend more time in gameplay have higher levels of physiological stress. So that's a little bit about the game outcomes. I'm going to continue on and show you a little bit about how um, how they kind of broke down by different um, by di by the different areas, as you'll see in these next things. So you can see here, like this next slide is the game genre by population. Um, kind of an interesting slide, um, in my opinion. And uh, simply because it's, as you can see here, that um, by far role-playing games have the most of all. Um, and you can see there that with the legend that green is K-12 and orange, like that burnt orange is higher ed and um, adult is yellow. But you can see the different breakdown in these stacked, uh, I think they call them stacked um, column graphs here, um, and how they were broken down by the different areas here. By the way, if you have questions as we go, feel free to ask, um, or you can wait till the end. That's fine, too. Um, Susan, I apologize. I didn't see your question until now in the chat. Uh, um, you, you said, um, what is a somatosensory game? So um, so the uh, somatosensory is very similar to um, physiological, um, those sorts of games. It's a game that... Um, that deals with kind of your sensory responses, um, whether it's physical sensories in particular here. Uh, so it's your, um, like maybe like a physical reaction of your heartbeat or um, in increases stress or um, a change in um, your overall um, physical abilities. Um, and it depends on, yes, it depends on them to play the game. Um, it, that is generally speaking how somatosensory games are, are defined, yes. You, you're using your difficult, different physical senses, and a lot of them are exercise games. Um, so like with the Wii, which I think a lot of people would know, but also others now as well. Um, so that's sort of, type of types of games. So here's another interesting um, one to look at, um, and this is the content area by population studied. Um, and as you can see here, um, that by far, in our, our, our area, green being K-12, had the most science-related games. Uh, the next, I think the next area up was entertainment-related games. So science and entertainment were the biggest used in research in the K-12 environment, and after that being math and then social studies, it looks like.
Okay. Um, so this is um, the uh, this this one here is the game outcomes by population, um, and once again, it's looking at. Um, so you can see our, our environment here, our K-12 population here, um, knowledge acquisition games, the, by far the largest for, for K-12. Uh, the next one being cognitive and perceptual skills, um, and then affective, but by far knowledge acquisition games. Probably not a surprising result, uh, but one that's important to note nonetheless. Um, and then this one, I'm not actually sure how, how helpful this one is, but I, I thought it would be really interesting to look at it by genre, um, do genre by outcome. Um, so here you could see that, like, for example, that knowledge acquisition um, was, I thought this was actually a surprising thing, that there was a lot of knowledge acquisition games used, role-playing games were used for knowledge acquisition, which I wouldn't have thought a role-playing game would be used for something with a, such a low level um, uh, learning objective. Um, simulation games, I, I, that was another one that I was surprised of, that I thought simulations and simulation games would not be knowledge acquisition right, games, right? But um, they seem to be being used in that manner. Um, so maybe a mismatch there. Um, a few of the practitioner recommendations that we had in our report. Um, 38 of the papers reviewed concerned the use of entertainment games. Um, and to, I mean, it's probably not much of a surprise that, that that number of games from the entertainment industry were reviewed or were in research um, or, or were, were looked at. Total revenue for the entertainment game industry worldwide last year was um, 91 and a half billion with 23 and a half of that being in the US. Um, so there's obviously a wide range of entertainment games, high quality and low quality games available. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting to look at this because it, even though it's true that entertainment games need to be adapted for use in educational situations, um, this evidence of the amount of research that's been done should not stop school administrators and teachers from looking for more ways to integrate these games into the classroom. Um, simply because there is a large amount of research on them, um, and so um, it shows. I think a lot of a lot of it shows is that the high quality of the games is a strong inducement for student use in learning. The next one really just emphasized the use of science and health games, um, and one of the things that might be less evident from um, from this particular study is that science-related games accounted for 34 of the papers reviewed and health-related 22 papers. Um, that amount of quality research, uh, I started asking myself why, and I went back and looked at every single one of those studies of the 34 plus 22, so, so 56 studies had an acknowledgement to funding for that particular study. Um, so even though I didn't include that little nugget in the particular report, I think it's important to realize that um, these were funded and that funded research brings quality research and larger amounts of research in a particular area. Um, I think it should be a call for teachers and administrators to seek to integrate these specific science and health games into their schools, but it also should serve as an important indicator policy-wise of how we can encourage high quality research on specific games. And that's through public funding. And that's my that's my little soapbox. So I'll get off of that right now. Um, the, okay. So the, the last uh, or the the fourth point on practitioner recommendations is to explore ways to align game game outcomes with educational standards. Um, sorry about that. Um, so simulations and role-playing games were by far the most um, popular ga game genres used in K-12 research, although simulations were much more so when including other aged participants. Um, uh, some other lit reviews that have been done looked at suggested that simulations might be easier to integrate into learning than other game genres, um, but the use of role-playing games in K-12 research appears more prevalent than with other participants. Um, 
meaning there's probably some other factors involved there. Um, the lack of the use of other game genres, though, in K-12 ed education research suggests that it might be more difficult to align game outcomes with educational standards. And so we probably need to be spending more time there on um, those game outcomes. Um, I think I missed one. I'm sorry, I skipped. I think I skipped number th number three there, didn't I? Um, which is the um, use games with physiological emphasize physiological outcomes in the classroom. Um, I thought, found it fascinating that most of those studies, uh, research studies, involved higher ed students or older adults um, testing exercise um, related games or other somatosensory related games. Um, and not K-12 students specifically. Um, I think we've learned a lot through this research about the successful use of these types of games to support better health outcomes. Um, what I was surprised by was that the research potential has not yet been realized in the K-12 classroom. Um, and so it's a really a kind of a surprise because there is a lot of funding available for health-related research with children, um, and it's, it's available and it's actually plentiful um, with the obesity level and kids rising among other health problems. Um, I, I see a, a few questions. Um, I'll take a little break here and answer those before I get to the fourth register recommendation. Um, is it a game by definition of entertainment or entertaining? Yes, Susan, that's true. Um, in particular, when I was focusing on entertainment games, I meant games that were produced by like a for-profit company for the purpose of entertainment and not for an educational purpose. Um, oh, Justin, thanks, yeah, for pointing out that funding for development, the U.S. Department of Ed is currently running a challenge, an educational simulations challenge that uh, I think a lot of people might be interested in learning about or researching. That's good. Um, and then, of course, I think, not to say the last recommendation on the list there, but the, th the fourth one, or the, uh, actually, it is the last one, to partner with university researchers to extend research. And remember, this is a practitioner recommendation. Um, in our study, nearly 38% of the K-12 research reviewed concerned games that had a knowledge um, acquisition outcome, despite the fact that they covered a lot of different genres, most notably role-playing, simulation games, simulations, and adventure. Um, and 39% of the games used in higher ed, for example, also um, had a knowledge acquisition outcome, um, showing that it's really a focus for a wide audience range. Um, and I find it's really concerning because as others in the industry have, have and other researchers have noted, um, so many practitioners and proponents appear to champion the use of games for developing higher order thinking skills. So no, think things like that are not knowledge acquisition necessarily. Um, so even though the study reviewed research in the other outcome categories like affective and cognitive perceptual skills and soft skills and things, the most that can be said is that they're really promising beginnings to research in those fields, and especially at the K-12 level. Um, and so it's a bit of a mystery, uh, and it may just be that the, uh, this type of research might be more easy. Um, knowledge acquisition research may just be the low-hanging fruit. It might be more easily replicable um, in K-12 schools. Um, it may be harder to get informed consent from parents and teachers. Um, it may be harder to um, to kind of cast all that division, cast that to enough uh, stakeholders. Um, but definitely more university and uh, with universities partnerships with K-12 schools would help researchers to see the need to develop and test games for these other skills. Um, so. <coughs> Just to, as, just to kind of almost in conclusion here, I'm almost, on, I think I'm on the last slide here or close to it. Um, I really want to uh, just think a little bit more bigger picture here. Um, and that is that um, researcher thoughts, a little bit my thoughts. The focus on research, um, I, I think researchers really need to look and focus research on online games and test the games in an online environment. Um, MVLRI, as you all know, focuses on a lot of online and blended research. Um, but with that not being very prevalent, 
Um, there are a whole host of issues that when you take research from the brick and mortar classroom with games and bring it online that are going to come up. Uh, and we definitely really need that um, a lot. Um, I, I found it really interesting that so many of the games were playable online um, that were being tested, but they, but they were still tested in a face-to-face -face classroom or lab. And as a researcher, I could see that that might be seen as a more controlled environment, um, but still very important to test it in an online environment um, where, um, where, the, where we can really determine the kind of scaffolding that might be needed for teachers um, if the games are implemented in those online environments. Okay. Um, and then just some policy considerations. Um, I think we need to really consider, and this might seem like it's going a bridge too far, and I would understand that if, if, if you see that, but we need to consider why maybe games just for knowledge acquisition are, are, are dominating things. Uh, probably because they're easier to make and they run with uh, on slower internet speed um, type machines. Um, and if you look at, like, for example, the U.S. internet speed, average speed in the inter of internet access in schools compared to almost any other developed nation or a lot of developed nations, we, we fall behind. We, we're definitely lagging behind. And I, I think that if, if we do things like bridge rural gaps in internet access and speed, if we understand and address something called the homework gap, which, by the way, is, is, is the gap in internet access at home, um, where students often may not have it at home or they may only have access on their phone at home versus, um, uh, versus in the classroom. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll come up with perhaps some better environments that we're, where we can test higher end games and games that are, are able to uh, be developed um, for um, more effective and cognitive skills related um, outcomes. Um, and so maybe just doing some of those things that they're at the bottom, like commissioning research to determine access levels, offering mobile hotspots for students to check out, and just better accessibility overall for games would be helpful. Um, so that's it for the presentation. It looks like I still have a little bit of time available for questions. Um, I'll first go to the, um, to the, to the uh, chat and start to answer those a little bit. Um, Susan, you said um, these are mostly individually played games. Are you are you asking just in general um, for the for for what for what I reviewed? Um, some were individual, some were collaborative, or like where you played like like say a role playing game where you were part of a group that you were working together and stuff. Ah, collaborative games for online learning. Um, that that is that is something that there was less of, um, and I think once again I think that's that's something that could be an easy thing of going back and looking through these 177 studies and 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 looking about which ones were collaborative, which ones were not. That would you know take me take a few hours to do that sort of a thing. But um, my my feel for that was that um, there were definitely a lot less collaborative, mainly because it's a challenge. Yes. And it introduces a lot of variables. So it depends on what you're testing, right? So if you're testing something like knowledge acquisition, it's going to look different in a um, in a collaborative versus individual basis. And our whole society is focused so much on individual achievement, less or and, and not really on the collaborative stuff. So I think that's probably why it's more on the individual side of things. Any other questions? I did want to thank um, Michigan Virtual Lear Lear Learning um, Research Institute, MVLRI, and, um, and all the people here who interacted with me, as well as those who are not here. Um, and uh, it's been a great, um, uh, great time interacting with you folks, and uh, look forward to any opportunities in the future. Susan, yeah, I mean, 
it's obviously your opinion on that in terms of, versus mine. So I'm, I'm not saying that I'm right necessarily, but I think it is a logistical challenge. You're right. Um, definitely a logistical challenge. And um, just so you know, Susan, um, if you want to dig into the methods of how I did it, it's in one of the appendices um, So in uh, that are behind the report at the end of the report. Ah, yes, Catherine, thank you for your question. Um, do I see myself doing more with gaming? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Um, it's interesting you, you say that, you ask that question, because I just got, um, I, I definitely see myself doing more with gaming in my, re my own research agenda. Um, I'm working with a local art museum in the area uh, in northwest Arkansas. It's called Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, um, and they have created two online courses, um, and therefore one is art appreciation, um, and the other one is, it's called art plus process, where students are actually getting more into creating their own art. Um, and both are involved the use of something called um, Gallery 5, which is a, uh, a simulation, um, not a simulation game, a simulation of an art um, gallery where you can actually go into a 3D environment with or without a headset um, and interact and hang paintings and put up um, information uh, plaques and adjust lighting and all kinds of different things. Um, so really the, the vision of that was is from the, the main benefactor of the museum, Alice Walton, who has always really wanted to reach out to rural students in the South and provide um, art experiences for them um, where they may not have it otherwise. Um, and so I've been involved mainly in the evaluation of the courses and the immersive environment. Um, and so that is something that I'm very interested in. Uh, beyond that, my research agenda generally touches on uh, kind of the impact of games, really immersive environments in general, so immersive games on uh, vulnerable populations um, in the K-12 online learning. Uh, in, in blended learning environments. So um, definitely uh, see myself doing this a lot more. I just, uh, I think I will probably be uh, be digging a little bit deeper locally. I'm working with a local elementary school. Um, I'm, I've set up a, um, a mobile um, usability lab on my, on my laptop. Um, sorry if I'm, I might be, if I'm boring people, just let me know, but um, I have a, um, I just received in the mail today, um, a scientific contextual EEG um, that plugs into my laptop. Um, and I have um, eye tracking software as well, um, and peripherals, as well as um, for skin connectivity and uh, pulse and all these sorts of things. Um, Susan, your question about the, the uh, art course, yes. But there's actually two courses that they developed. Uh, for the art museum, that's correct. And I want to emphasize, I did not develop the course. I, I've, I'm doing the evaluation of those courses. Okay, Catherine, let me read your question. Hold on. I know that this wasn't part of the lit review so much, but do you see the work in gaming and schools when it comes to integration into curriculum? Do you see them as supplemental or, se or seamless? Um, no, I didn't actually cover it earlier, but I would say it kind of falls under um, one of my last slides, right, the practitioner recommendations, right, um, where I said to explore ways to align game outcomes with educational standards. Um, they seem to be very supplemental, um, is what I'm trying to say. Um, teachers see them as something that they want to use, um, and, and they're almost like a sadness in their voices, like, oh, yeah, I really wish I could use that, because they realize that they, they could be something that is a lot more engaging, where the students could learn it, but, uh, but they're really have difficulty aligning it with the standards um, in, in their state or uh, whether it's Common Core or something else like here in Arkansas, we have the Arkansas State Standards. Um, so I, I think it's because of that more than anything 
that they're more of an add-on, a supplemental type thing, rather than something that is, is seamlessly integrated into the curriculum. Um, and uh, it's interesting, I have a, a follow-up to this that um, that didn't, to this project that unfortunately, my re, re, I, I basically requ requested information from both K-12 Incorporated and um, Connections on the games that they used in their online curriculums. And both of them, like in the last week, got back to me that information. So I haven't processed that yet. So, um, but kind of a, in a follow-up, I wanna actually look at Okay, how did this extra information exactly timing being impeccable, Catherine? I want to compare that extra information that I'm getting um, or that I've received now with um, with what uh, the lit review I did on um, gaming in games used in the K-12 classroom. Because um, my, I mean, just from reading over the lists, I I can already tell you that um, it's it's um, I was surprised by how few games were used by, by, by both of those big, uh, uh, big providers, so. Nice, Catherine, nice trying to get me into a Bolo blog post. Yeah, I'll definitely be interested in that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm definitely interested in that. Um, exactly what they consider a game, um, Susan, in, in some of it, they were they were saying, well, do you consider a manip manipulative a game? Um, and they would show me different things, and uh, some were, I would maybe, and some I wasn't. But um, I was really surprised by how few actually they used. Um, and I think that's actually an area where fully online schools could really use to grow, um, because if, uh, as we all know, the research on achievement of students in K twelve online or kindergarten through 12th grade online schools um, really struggle compared to brick and mortar schools, um, brick and mortar students. So um, why not look for more engaging ways, ways that have been proven in the research and grab a bunch of these games and try to integrate them into your curriculum. Yeah, Susan, that's right. Some of the, they do advertise some of the games when they're just little boring manipulatives that boring being your term absolutely any other questions oh my pleasure um this is something i could i could literally sit and kind of whether it's at a conference or or at a uh in, in with with other faculty and, and chat with for a long time. Um, yeah, Catherine, let me go ahead and turn back to that last slide. So if someone wants to contact me, whether they're listening to this by recording or or right here in person, um, here's my slide where there's a contact information. I'm at the University of Arkansas. I'm an assistant professor of educational technology. You can also contact me through Twitter, um, etechguy. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't, although I don't use Twitter a ton, but you can contact me by email or, the, or there and um, would love to collaborate with you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Dennis. That was a really informative overview of uh, the use of games. Again, we would encourage folks to check out the full research paper, which I will post the link to again in the chat window. And we have just a couple of housekeeping items uh, from MVLRI before we wrap up today's presentation. Uh, we do just wanna encourage folks to check out a couple of our other initiatives. We have a virtual viewpoints podcast uh, where we interview guests uh, for short episodes of around 15 to 20, sometimes longer, 20 to 25 minutes, uh, and just talk about their work and their careers in online and blended learning and how research impacts that work. So we encourage you to check that link out there to, to learn more about that podcast. You can find us in 
iTunes or the Google Play Store, we encourage you to subscribe. Uh, we also have our guest blogger program. So if you're interested in writing about some of your, your own research that you're conducting, uh, or if you're interested in garnering feedback on some research that's in progress, uh, we would encourage you to check out the link there to learn more about our guest blogger program if you would like to write for our blog. Uh, we also have an upcoming webinar, uh, Mar March 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be hosting Brianne Moore Adams from Virginia Commonwealth University to hear about her research on establishing presence and community in online classrooms. So we encourage you to mark your calendars for that one. Uh, we will be sending out uh, reminders through our email list as well. Uh, in the meantime, you can keep up with us and all of our goings on, uh, you can sign up for our email uh, address by clicking our email listserv, sorry, by clicking that second link there. Uh, you can contact us directly by uh, contacting us through email mvlri at mivu.org. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, you can also view all of our archived webinar recordings on our YouTube channel uh, by visiting our YouTube address there. And you can expect the recording of this webinar to be up within the next 24 to 36 hours. So we encourage you to go and, uh, and, and watch and share as well. You can also see all of our upcoming webinars through I think uh, about the end of May now. We have uh, a lot of webinars scheduled already through the end of May. So you can visit our website at mvlri.org slash presentations slash webinars to see more of the webinars that we have upcoming. So we want to again thanks everyone, thank everyone for coming out today uh, and enjoy the rest of your week. Take care.